Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor and uh, a pleasure to be able to participate in this conference. So I'm going to talk about the Russian economy and its impact on politics. And I thought I would start, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to say a little bit about how the Russian economy has changed over the last 25 years. Uh, then I'll talk about the current economic crisis. And then I'll say something about the political consequences uh, of this crisis and how economic problems uh, may manifest themselves in politics. Now, the Russian economy over the last 25 years uh, has obviously changed a lot, and I would say there are two major sets of influences which help to explain how it's changed. Uh, these are the same as in any other country, but more extremely so in Russia. First of all, there are global factors. Uh, the oil price, international liquidity, by which I mean the extent to which uh, young people in London and New York are willing to invest money, usually other people's money, in risky ventures around the world. And uh, crises elsewhere, which uh, have a way of ending up as crises in Russia. Then there are domestic factors. Uh, there's the legacy of communism, which uh, in the 90s created one or two problems. And there's economic policy uh, of the Russian government uh, itself, which has changed a lot over the period. Now here in one picture uh, is what has happened in the Russian economy over the last 25 years. It's a graph of GDP, gross domestic product, in Russia, an index uh, starting at 100 in 1990. And you see, just looking at that, there have been various different phases in the, uh, in, in the development of the economy. So first of all, at the beginning, there was uh, a number of years of post-communist recession. All the communist countries, all the places where communism collapsed, underwent a very sharp drop uh, in output uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, this certainly happened in Russia. Then the next phase uh, was the phase of the Asian financial crisis, which broke out in 1997 and uh, hit Russia very hard in 1998. Uh, this delayed, I would say, by several years, uh, the recovery, which otherwise might have begun in 1996. And then we have some very positive years in the Russian economy. From 1999, we see uh, rapid growth. Uh, this is, uh, in large part, recovery. It's also the time when we see the effect of the market reforms, which were introduced in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, economic business develops, the economy develops. It's also a period in which economic policy in Russia is, is not bad at all. Uh, the early Putin, up to about 2002, 2003, uh, listened to uh, some quite smart economic advisors. Uh, they reduced the tax rates, they instituted a 13% flat income tax, uh, deregulated, uh, fought inflation, managed to bring it down, and started building up reserves. But then, as time went on, economic policy got worse. And I think uh, the period of high growth that followed that in the mid-2000s uh, can be attributed uh, mostly to the rising price of oil, and also to global liquidity. It was a period in which interest rates were very low worldwide. How do I know that oil was important? You often hear this, that the uh, Russian economy is all about oil and gas. Uh, well, here I just superimpose a graph of the oil price on top of GDP. Now, uh, we see that in some periods there isn't much of a relationship between the oil price and what's going on with GDP. Uh, for instance, in the early 90s, uh, and in the early 2000s, the oil price is low but quite flat. And in one case, GDP is falling sharply. In the other, it's rising sharply. But in the period from 2005 through 2008, we see, we see a very sharp rise uh, in the price of oil and uh, also a very sharp rise in GDP. And studies have, uh, have generally come to the conclusion that about a half of the growth in that uh, period can be attributed to the rising price of oil. But it wasn't just oil, uh, because in that period also, it was uh, a time of uh, easy money worldwide. Uh, those uh, young men and women in New York and London 
uh, had a lot of money to invest in different places. Interest rates in the West were low, so they were looking for returns elsewhere. And we see that in this period, uh, even as the Russian state was paying down its foreign debt, the foreign debt of Russian banks and corporations uh, rose very dramatically. Uh, the big corporations were borrowing a lot from uh, Western banks uh, and uh, accruing uh, a very large debt. So returning to this, uh, this uh, timeline, uh, then from 2008, 2009, we get into the period uh, where the global economy undergoes this massive uh, recession, uh, global financial crisis, and then a uh, rather feeble recovery. And meanwhile in Russia, uh, economic policy has gone from uh, bad to worse. Uh, in fact, it's quite awful uh, by this period. And as you see, GDP is slowing down. Okay, now one point I want to, to emphasize because uh, the, the discussion so far this morning has been very gloomy. Uh, one, one slightly more positive point I want to, to make is that the period from 2000 to 2008 saw a very dramatic modernization of Russian society. So I don't uh, entirely agree with Nikolai, I agree with him about most things, but I don't entirely agree that it was 25 years wasted and that the Russia we've returned to in, 19, in, in 2015 is the same as the Russia we left in 1990. Uh, it's changed in a lot of ways. Uh, of course, Kweli was talking about uh, uh, human capital and so on and social capital, so, so that's, that may be another story. But if we look at society and uh, the economy, uh, many indicators show just how much uh, has has changed, how much Russia has developed in that time. Uh, just to start with, uh, GDP per capita expressed uh, in purchasing power parity terms uh, almost tripled. The average annual wage grew even faster. Russians got computers. Uh, they got cell phones, lots of cell phones. Uh, more Russians got cars. More Russians took trips abroad. And the number of, uh, of young Russians graduating from colleges and universities uh, grew very, very dramatically uh, in this period. So it's really a breakthrough uh, in, in multiple dimensions uh, of the economy and society. And I think that helps to explain these middle class protests that broke out against electoral fraud uh, in December 2011 and continued through, de December, uh, to, through 2012. This was very much uh, the outgrowth of this process of rapid modernization. It was highly centered in the big cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg, a few others, uh, among the most modernized groups. But simultaneously during this time, between 2000 and 2011, as I mentioned, economic policy changed. It changed from a policy that I would say initially was quite sensible and uh, market-oriented. And this early policy uh, was associated with the long-serving finance minister, Alexei Kudrin, who's pictured here uh, talking to Putin. So economic policy changed from, from that sensible uh, policy to one uh, that today is apparently uh, aimed at helping certain old acquaintances of Putin uh, to be able to afford to build palaces. That brings us to the current economic crisis. So what's, what's going on there? Well, really since 2012, when the recovery from the global financial crisis fizzled out in Russia, there's been a downward trend in GDP. And then last year, uh, the crisis uh, metastasized and we saw uh, a very sharp drop in the oil price, this is global influences again, followed by a very sharp plunge in the value of the ruble and an increase in inflation. Now the crisis, I would say, has a number of different elements uh, which reinforce each other, make it much harder to solve. First of all, it's a debt crisis. Uh, banks and corporations owe about $550 billion to Western banks, and they have to pay $100 billion of that this year. Uh, we saw that big rise on the graph uh, in borrowing. And Western sanctions since last July have cut off uh, the big Russian corporations and banks from refinancing in the West, so they have to pay this money back. They can't roll it over. 
The debt crisis could turn into a banking crisis. Some would say that's already happening. Uh, one major bank collapsed in December, got a $2.4 billion bailout from the government. Uh, others have been recapitalized. The government understands that it's going to have to lay aside tens of billions of dollars uh, to deal with this. And some people are saying that maybe a third of Russian banks uh, could go bankrupt. It's also a crisis in living standards, a crisis for the population. Uh, because consumer prices have risen sharply, up 11% last year, up more than 15% in January, year on year. Uh, and that has meant that the real wage has fallen. It fell by uh, 5% last year. And in January, as, as I understand it, it's fallen by 8% per compared to January of the previous year. Uh, and just to make things a little bit uh, harder for the Russian population, uh, Putin placed an embargo on food coming from the European Union. Uh, so, Matt said that, uh, that yesterday that we don't see uh, revolutions arising over the cheese, uh, but I was in a, a restaurant in Moscow in, in January a few weeks ago, and uh, the owner was telling me most things they can replace. So the prosciutto is not from Italy now, it's from Argentina, but it's pretty good. Uh, they can get uh, Mediterranean sea bass from Turkey instead of Greece. Uh, they, grow, they grow a lot of things themselves outside Moscow, but cheese takes a culture that develops over hundreds of years. Uh, Russian, Russians cannot make Parmesan. <laughs> it's also a, a crisis uh, in the sense of a recession. GDP is projected by different people to fall from 1% to 10% uh, this year, and the estimates keep dropping. Nobody knows precisely, and it's a budget crisis. The finance minister has called for 10% spending cuts across the board, except for the military. They'll probably need to cut even more than that. Okay, so uh, an extremely severe crisis, the worst since uh, the end of communism, the crisis that followed communism. So what are the political consequences? Well, as I'm sure you know, and as Nina mentioned, Putin has always had high ratings. They've never... Uh, since he's been president, they've never fallen below 60% uh, approval. And this matters. Uh, you might think it's strange that people care about approval ratings in a society or a state that has become more authoritarian. But in fact, uh, ratings are very important when they exist in authoritarian states. Uh, Putin's popularity helped him to centralize power early in the 2000s. Helped to keep his, at his uh, elites in line when his ratings fall, critics often surface. Uh, in the 1990s, we, we saw with Yeltsin that even though the Constitution gave him really pretty strong powers as president, uh, he was nevertheless, as his approval rating fell, as he became very unpopular, he was blocked uh, by opposition in the parliament, uh, by opposition from the regional governors, and so on. So approval matters, and uh, what explains uh, the president's approval ratings? Well, I've done a bit of research on this, and uh, my conclusion is that two things, uh, more than any others, uh, help to explain this. First of all, the economy, and secondly, war. In fact, it's very similar to what explains uh, approval ratings in the US and in many other countries. And let me just uh, show a little bit of evidence uh, to convince you of this. So this green squiggly line, is a spiky line, is, is a measure of economic sentiment. It's simply the percent of Russians who said, in answer to pollsters, that the economy was doing well, minus the percent that said it was doing badly. And I've rescaled it up. Uh, but basically, it's, it's, it's how positive Russians were feeling about current economic performance. What about war? Well, the, most of the, the war that loomed large uh, in Russia in the early 2000s, of course, was the second Chechnya war. And one poll asked respondents, Russian respondents, uh, do you think that uh, Russia could, should, the government should continue the war in Chechnya, or should we negotiate with the rebels? And this red line is just the percent of respondents that said, continue the war. So basically supporting Putin's policy of sending the troops back into Chechnya and fighting. And you see, uh, when he comes into power, uh, 99, 2000, uh, there's a spike and it's very high level of support for the war, but it falls. So these two factors, if you add them together, you just add these two lines together, you get a measure of economic sentiment plus support for the Chechnya war. 
that's the same line again. And if we superimpose on that the president's approval ratings over time, we get a, a, a relationship that's almost too good to be true. <laughs> but I promise I didn't make this up. So that convinces me that really over time the changes in presidential popularity have a lot to do with uh, changes in people's perceptions of how the economy is doing and uh, their attitudes towards uh, the ongoing war. Well, it works pretty well until about 2009 and then things get a little bit screwy. So what's going on there? Has presidential approval, the president's rating, has it delinked from the economy? I did a bit more research on this. My conclusion is no. Uh, in fact, the pattern changes in the way that we see because those people who are upset about the economy, who think the economy is doing badly, well, earlier on, they still gave Putin the benefit of the doubt and they still, at high levels, uh, supported him, but they became more negative. They blamed Putin personally more for the bad economy. And so that depressed uh, his rating even as the economy was improving a bit. The people who thought that it was still bad became more negative and this pushed down his rating even though objectively the economy was, uh, was, was gradually recovering a bit. And we see this in various other evidence that people initially blamed the global financial crisis on the West but then over time they start blaming the Russian government more. Okay. So by 2013, the economy's in decline. Putin's rating is at its lowest level since 2000. It's uh, down to about 61%. And pretty much everybody agrees that the only solution to the economic problems is radical reform, liberalization, opening up the economy more. Bring back Kudrin. And there's discussion of this. At least we hear rumors in, in the summer of 2013 that the people in the Kremlin are really considering this option, bringing back Kudrin, allowing him to introduce new economic reforms, more opening to the West, but Putin and his friends decide against that. So what else can they do? They understand that, that buying popularity with economic growth is going to be increasingly difficult, so Putin needs a new strategy. And it's about then that intelligence services start to get reports of soldiers in unmarked uniforms uh, occupying key areas in the Crimea. Now, I'm not saying that that was the only motivation for military action in Ukraine, or even the main motivation. Clearly, there were a lot of things going on. What I am saying is that all of this was an important part of the background. We see Putin's rating, which had been going down really after peaking in 2008, uh, getting lower and lower. Then uh, with the Crimea intervention, it shoots up. So the question we all want to know the answer to is, uh, will this work? Will this work in the medium run? Uh, his ratings have stayed high uh, for a long time already, for many months. And uh, what can I say about this? Well, previous war-related surges of support have turned out to be temporary. We see here in, the, in, in 99 to 2000, there's this big surge of support for Putin, which I associate with Chechnya, but it falls quite quickly within a year or a year and a half. And I think what keeps his rating high after that is this very strong economic recovery, which comes and takes over. And I showed you the graph of of the percentage that supported continuing the military operation, you saw that that fell pretty sharply. In the war in Georgia in 2008, we see another spike. It's small because he's already up in the 80s. There isn't much higher he can go. Uh, but it also falls quite quickly. And uh, we return to this sort of uh, this effect of the uh, global financial crisis and deteriorating economy. So, is it going to be like that? Well, I think his, his approval ratings have stayed high for longer uh, than I would have expected at the start. Uh, but uh, just before turning to the conclu my concluding remarks, uh, there's some more reason why we should doubt that this uh, effect will be 
long-lasting. Uh, in order to build a new base of support uh, on Russian nationalism, on anti-Western sentiment, on support for the, the fighters in Ukraine, Putin has to flip his support base from what it was in the past. Uh, Matt Rozhensky mentioned this yesterday, but it's not widely appreciated in the West, that the le strongest support for Putin does not come from the ultra-nationalist Russians, the people who are really anti-Western. It comes from the pro-Western forces in Russian society. Uh, looking at the poll data, if you uh, look at the rate of support for Putin among people who say that, on the whole, they feel positively towards the US, the rate of support in May 2013 was 74%. So in May 2013, before all the Ukraine stuff happened, 74% of those who felt good about the US supported Putin. Among people who said they felt bad about the US, uh, the rate was uh, 42% or 43%, much lower. Uh, the real nationalists don't like Putin. They, they see him as uh, a member of the elite, uh, someone who hangs out with Berlusconi and Schroeder, uh, someone who's been too nice to the West. Uh, and they don't trust him. They have other heroes. Uh, so it's the pro-Russian, uh, so pro-American parts uh, of the Russian uh, population that are most supportive of Putin. Now, what's changed since then? Well, now everybody, or almost everybody, likes Putin. But still, 92% of the people who feel positively about the U.S. Uh, support Putin. Uh, it's about 83% of those who feel negatively towards the US. Uh, but uh, as uh, Nikolai said, this is a moment of euphoria. At the moment, basically all Russians, except for this, these very uh, resistant uh, 12 to uh, 20 percent, uh, are behind Putin. Uh, and you get these paradoxical results that among people who say that they totally do not support how the Russian government has acted towards Ukraine, to oppose the policy towards Ukraine, 52% say they support Putin. So I think uh, this is a kind of support which is based on rallying around, which is not based uh, on deeper uh, uh, belief in what Putin stands for, deeper support for his policies. It's based on something uh, more fragile, uh, more evanescent, uh, and uh, if he wants to build a base of support among the nationalists, I think he still has a lot of work to do. So in conclusion, uh, we won't know for a while whether Putin has reshaped the political landscape and come up with a political strategy that will still work in bad economic times, uh, given that the old strategy of, of, of providing a rise in living standards no longer seems to be viable. Has he got such a strategy? I doubt it. I suspect that his current popularity uh, could fail during this year and, and uh, as the economic crisis gets worse, as things get more complicated in Ukraine, as they probably will. Uh, I suspect that his, his ratings could fall. I'm sticking my neck out here. Uh, dangerous thing to do when you talk about Russia, obviously. Uh, so I may be wrong, but based on studying what's happened in the past, that seems the most likely option most likely variant. Uh, another thing we should bear in mind is that authoritarian leaders who've been in power for a long time, you could say any leaders who've been in power for a long time, tend to start to make mistakes. And these mistakes sometimes build on themselves, reinforce each other, lead to complex interactions in which things suddenly get out of control. Uh, I think Putin has already made some uh, major mistakes. I think uh, Ukraine, uh, Nikolai said, the, the, what he did in 2014 is irreversible. I think that's right. Uh, and it creates all sorts of problems, which are very complicated for him to deal with. Uh, so I think we can expect more s mistakes in the future. And that is very often how regimes like this fall apart. It's unpredictable because who can guess exactly which mistake somebody is going to make? Uh, but that's how it often happens. Uh, if that's right, uh, then we should expect to see turbulence, uh, but uh, we can't predict exactly how that will play out. Thank you.